Okay, and we are now live. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another one of Juarez's online engagement programs. And today we have what is known as an art and life session. Uh, I will just do a brief introduction first of myself. Uh, one of the things that we want to do today is audio description. So we are aware that there are people out there who are visually impaired and who are tuning into some of our programs. And so uh, I will start. My name is Alfian Saad. I'm the resident playwright of Wild Rice. I'm wearing a black polo t-shirt with white stripes. And I'm inside my room. Uh, and there is a bookcase behind me. Okay. Um, so just a little bit about today's uh, panel. It's called Who's Afraid of Digital Theater? I've always wanted to do a panel like this for a long time. Uh, not just about digital theater, but something that includes panelists from, from, from the region and not just in Singapore. And I think what we've realized is that with this new digital infrastructure, it has made these kinds of transnational encounters more possible uh, than ever before. I mean, I don't need to fly all my wonderful friends here down to Singapore for all of us to, in a sense, gather, right, in this virtual space. So. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce each of them, or rather, they will do uh, their own introductions. Let's call out Miss Jo Kukatas first, who is in Kuala Lumpur right now. Hello, I'm Jo Kukatas. I'm the artistic director of the Instant Cafe Theatre Company. Uh, at the moment, I'm in my study. Uh, I'm wearing a blue dress with a bright pink scarf, and behind me are books and uh, a wooden cat. Uh, which makes up my my study. Okay, thank you so much, Joe. All right, next uh, we're gonna have our two friends from Thailand. Uh, one of them is a translator, and one of them is the panelist. So he is a Kuwin Bishitkun and from the theater Thailand. Project director from uh, he's a project director of uh, Inborn Space. <laughs> he's wearing a grey t-shirt and we are in a milk tea shop. Okay, and, uh, and me, I'm the translator. My name is Xuan. I'm also an artist and I'm wearing a black t-shirt in the same um, milk tea shop. Okay, thank you so much there. Wow, Milk Tea Shop, that reminds me of the uh, Milk Tea Alliance, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Which is an alliance between people from Thailand and Hong Kong and Taiwan, right? Yeah, I feel so upset that we're, we're not part of this alliance. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, we should. We got Milk Tea also, right? We got yeah, like yeah. Teta Rate, right? We should mm -hmm. be included in this. Okay, and, uh, and our next panelist is uh, Sim Yan Ying or YY. Hi everyone, I'm Simian Ying. I also go by my initials YY. Um, I am a director, actor, theater creator um, based in New York City the last five years and will be for two more days and I'll be back in Singapore next week. I'm in, uh, I'm wearing a black v-neck top. There is a bed behind me and a door um, and my walls are white. Okay, thank you so much for that YY. Uh, by the way, we have a commenter uh, I'll just show this. It's Yisheng who says, oh my god, hi Chuan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and, and Yisheng also says, milk tea alliance for the win. So I believe like Yisheng and Chuan and, and Cho Chen were all collaborating on a show together, right? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. We worked together before. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. So old friends meet again. Okay. Uh, so today, I think maybe we can start off by talking about some of the works that some of you have created, uh, some of the online work that you've created, right? And, and I think just to start off, just to answer that question, who's afraid of digital theater, which is our title for today, uh, I'm afraid of digital theater. <laughs> okay. okay. It, it, I mean, there, there, there are two streams to that, right? Which is one is, I actually feel the level of risk in doing digital theater. For me, the analogy is like doing work in a theater where there might be a blackout anytime <laughs> or where the electricity might get cut off or where suddenly the actor suddenly 
freeze, right? <laughs> so, so for me, those are the kinds of, of course, live performance is always risky, but it just seems to me that the digital infrastructure also introduces other, other elements of risk. And so that's one, right? So the other fear is, of course, that maybe this will supersede or this will take over uh, or, or reshape live performance as we know it. Mm -hmm. So we know, for example, when music went digital, it led to quite profound and structural changes in the industry, mm -hmm. right? So not just piracy, but also in the in the disaggregation of the album format, for example. So people nowadays, like, they buy singles, they listen to singles on Spotify, and not necessarily an album, and listen to music in the order that an artist might have selected. It has also resulted to changes in things like um, cover art as well. Mm -hmm. So what, what does it mean for theatre to go digital? Okay, so I, mm -hmm. I, I hope that these are some of the questions that we will, we will uh, put on the table and that we will discuss today. Okay, all right. So, uh, but to start off with, why don't we introduce the audience to some of your works? Yeah, so let's pull up the slide today. Okay, this is our first slide. Uh, it's got the words, who's afraid of digital theater? Against a blue background and there's some digital numbers as well there. Okay, let's look at the first slide. Okay, so this is uh, my work. On this slide, you will see an image of a couple who are sitting on a sofa. They are both wearing virtual reality headsets and they are holding on to champagne glasses. Both of them are dressed quite formally. The man on the left side is dressed in something like a tuxedo. The woman on the right side is dressed in a black evening gown. So it looks like they are going out for night at the theater, but actually they're just in their sofa at home. Yeah, and the text on this slide says, A Cough in the Theater, March 2020, playwright Alfian Sa, director Frida Roll for Folk Theaten. So Folk Theaten is actually a Swedish theater company. Um, and Frida Roll is actually one of my good friends. So when the pandemic first hit Sweden, one of the things that the theater company did was to um, contact some of their international friends and ask them to submit a short piece for a program which is called Urgent Drama. And I happen to be one of those people who was asked. Um, so this is, uh, it's available on YouTube. You can, you can go look for it. Uh, it's called Urgent Drama. Uh, this piece is actually a pessimistic one because it envisions a future where people don't really physically go to the theater anymore. They stay at home and then just put on their, their headsets and then that's the theater experience for them. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, this is something that uh, we, can, we can discuss more, hopefully. Yeah. But this, this for me is the only thing that I produced <laughs> for this whole pandemic. Uh, because for Wild Rise, we've got quite a lot of archival recordings of our past works. So those are the things that we've been uploading online and sharing with our audiences. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a work from Instant Cafe Theatre by Jo. Why don't you help us describe it and talk about it? So this is a, a production of a play called Para, written by Alfian Sa'at. Uh, we called it Zoom Para because we decided to do the entire play uh, using Zoom as our format, e even though people then went to a, a virtual theatre called Cloud Theatre and watched mm -hmm. it on their website. Um, and, you know, they tried to replicate the act of going to the theatre as much as they could uh, mm -hmm. in, in that. I, I'll talk about that later. For now, I'll just describe this particular a still. So this mm -hmm. is a still from the production. A lot of the play takes place in the library of one of the characters. So here there are four boxes, four Zoom boxes, and each character is in their own homes. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, we try to uh, to set design their homes so they looked as if they could possibly be in the same library. So try to make put books um, in each room so that you have this idea of a library, try to keep the colors in the same kind of tones. Uh, so and each, and each actor is wearing quite a brightly colored t-shirt so they pop out from the screens as well. So in this way, try to um, set design uh, the image. And so here you, you see that image of, of four actors um, in separate spaces, but trying to in some way make us believe or suspend reality to believe they are in the same space. Right. Okay. Thank you for that, Joe. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to describe about this still? Um, um, well, I, I guess later we can talk about some of the, sure. some of the uh, challenges, you know, in we, that, that comes from using the, using the, the Zoom, the Zoom, <laughs> the Zoom form. 
sort of yep. speaking into each other. And mm. it was a lot of work to kind of get the actors to know where the other actor is. Because of course on Zoom, mm. the Zoom box does not show the actor where the other actor is in relationship to them. So right. we had to, they had to just right. learn, okay, at this right. point I have to face this way in this box. Right. We weren't right. always successful, but yep. uh, it was, that was quite a challenge, um, challenging aspect of the, of the performance for the actors okay. at least. Mm. Great, thanks, Joe. Okay, so this Zumpara, uh, done by Instant Cafe Theatre from Malaysia. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is a work created by YY uh, as well as Alvin Tan, and of course other people. So maybe YY, I can invite you to talk a little bit about this work. Sure, thanks, Alfian. Um, I think I'll start by just describing what's on this slide. So we have two images here. Um, both are production stills from uh, the production. They are both in Zoom uh, spaces. The first picture has six boxes. Um, in the first box, a man is holding a book. Uh, so you want to talk about race. In the second box, um, a woman is uh, washed in pink light. She's doing a movement gesture. Um, with her arm outstretched. Um, in the third box, uh, monochromatic colors, a man is doing the same gesture as the woman, arm outstretched as well. Fourth box, um, a man has a ring light behind him with his arm outstretched. The fifth box, a woman is holding on a book. I think it is called uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, yes, by Ibram X. Kendi. And in the sixth box, a woman is washed in uh, green light, uh, doing a physical gesture with her arm outstretched. And then in the second image, there are eight boxes here. It looks like a club of sorts. Um, in the first box, there is a man in a hoodie. Um, second box, uh, a man is kind of in a delirious state wearing a blonde wig. In the third one, um, a face is up close to the camera washed in pink light. Um, the fourth one, uh, a woman is in a white top just enjoying herself, having the time of her life. In the fifth box, um, there is a close-up of a face, my face, uh, washed in a Snapchat filter of color inversion of sorts. In the sixth box, there um, it's just like pattern paint splatters. And then in the seventh box, there is a uh, visual uh, that says the transit lounge in different permutations. And in the eighth box, there is a white mask just floating in a black vacuum space. Um, so this is uh, Who's There, which is an international virtual collaboration with artists based in Singapore, Malaysia, and the US. Um, right. We developed it in June. Uh, we started developing it in early June and July, and then had a production as part of New Ohio Theatre's Ice Factory Festival 2020. Um, mm -hmm. New Ohio Theatre is a downtown theatre company in New York City, and Ice Factory is their annual summer festival of new works it's in, in their 27th right. year now it's the first time they're doing like a virtual version of it mm. uh, so this show explores uh racial controversies in the three countries um mm -hmm. and really responds to the recent events of 2020 because so much has happened in 2020 like black lives matter like um right. the general elections in singapore and um, we're also looking at like identity conflicts within individuals um, stemming from race as well as sure. tension between individuals, really trying to see what we can learn if we talk about racial mm -hmm, issues, mm -hmm. um, through mm -hmm. the lens of someone else from a different country. Does it offer us fresh insights and what do we learn from this? Right. Um, and this show combines the elements like realism scenes, just like naturalistic, we're in our bedrooms talking to each other. Um, mm -hmm movement sequences, um, okay. multimedia by our incredible designer, Javon Chandra, yeah. um, as well as interview excerpts and right. also magic realism. And it's a team of 14 people working on it. Um, and I wow. co-edited it with Elvin Tan, um, who is the artistic director of The Necessary Stage. Wow. Okay. So first of all, Yanyin, congratulations for describing the very <laughs> visually complex <laughs> <laughs> image. I'm so sorry. I, I pulled no, out okay. this image. I mean, there were there were there were easier images, but but I I'm sorry. I, I could go, but um, no, 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 but it's good. Uh, the detail is 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 good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So thank you for introducing uh, that work. Um, let's move on, and then later we can come back. Yeah, to to more discussion on this. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, I will just describe this. 
uh, this is the project by Quinn and his friends. It's called In Own Space. This is part one of it that was done in June 2020. So let me describe the, the slide. There are four screens on this slide. In the first screen in the top left, there is Quinn himself. He's sitting in a sofa and um, there is some Thai text there, which I will ask Chuan to help me with. <laughs> yeah, so there's uh, some, some Thai text uh, at, at the bottom of the top left yep. uh, square. Mm -hmm. It said, um, uh, who said I'm stressed? I'm not stressed. Okay, who says I'm stressed? <laughs> I'm not stressed. Okay, right. Yeah. So in the, in the top right screen, uh, we have a woman who's inside her room. She's got dyed blonde mm -hmm. hair. She looks like she's exercising by doing steps on her bed. Uh, in the bottom right, we actually have Chuan himself, our translator for today. And he's sitting on a sofa in his room and he's got thermometer in his mouth. Uh, and also there's a pack of cigarettes on the table in front of him. Okay, and in the bottom left image, we have a woman who's on a on a turquoise kind of sofa or teal. Uh, and she's sitting down with one leg over the, over, the, over the other. And she's got what looks like a plant or leaves on her head. Okay. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about this project, Quinn? So in own space actually happened when the, we got the lockdown in Bangkok uh, for yeah. COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the artist was disconnected from each other and also we got disconnected from the audience. Right. Mm. So there's another project director, Pham, so she posts mm -hmm. on her Facebook, what should we do about this situation? Right. And there are many, uh, many opinions, many suggestions from many artists. Mm -hmm. So Gwyn uh, and Phon Plum start this project by contact, uh, contacting 15 artists to do right. a solo performance and connect each piece together. So it's kind of um, every artist needs to receive or inspired by some message of the video before them. They cannot think uh. beforehand. They need to wait until the day. Right. Everyone has two minutes for their own uh, video. Right. And in the last day, so it, it happened each day, daily, for 15 mm -hmm. days. And at the, at the last day, uh, yeah. he combined all the videos together into one piece. And we can right. look from the first and to the last. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So uh, my question is, did you have to create a video in only one day? Oh, yes. In own space, we will have for one. Yes, in, in, in own space version one, uh, yeah. everyone has only one day or less than one day, actually. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. He, did, he needs to post it. So yeah. we, we saw something at like 9 p.m., 8 p.m., maybe 9 p.m. You're and right. then two minutes after that, we need to figure yeah. out what to do next and send it back to him before 6 p.m. another day. Wow. Okay, wow. So that's the kind of uh, restriction that that you give to the artist. Okay, my next question is like in terms of the, the message that you send to the next artist, is it a message that's inside the work itself or did you like pass on the message by writing or something like that? Hmm. So it's uh, it, it's in the work. Yeah, oh, so you work might do something to another person. The next person watch what happened and they and then get inspired and that. I see. Okay, okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um next slide please. And uh I skipped one one phase of the evolution of this work. So we uh, straight away to in own space part three but i just want to say that there was in own space part two where the project was done by students from various universities right 
Yeah. Okay. So let me just describe this slide, uh, which is in Own Space Part 3 in August 2020. It has nine artists from Thailand, Japan, and South Korea. So on the slide, we have also four screens. Uh, in the top left one, I believe is a Korean artist who's teaching some choreography to her father. The Korean artist, she is wearing like, uh, I'm so bad with colors, you know, I swear, pale yellow. <laughs> pale yellow blouse and her father is wearing like a green uh leaf green t-shirt and she's showing some handwork uh for her father to to copy i believe okay on the top right we have queen himself he's uh, doing some choreography in an open space behind him is a brownish wall and then you can also see some plants and trees in the background as well in the bottom right we have what looks like a rooftop and the the, the floor is green and then you can see in the background, you can see a scenery of what I believe is a city in Korea. Uh, there is an artist, a female artist, and she has got what looks like a green basket over her head. So she's just standing, she's doing a dance, and there's a basket over her head. Uh, in the last screen, which is in the bottom left, we have a Japanese traditional dancer. Uh, he's in a large room. It looks very Japanese because you have the sliding doors uh, in the background. And he's, he looks like he's kneeling down and his arms are outstretched. Yeah. So I, I want to ask Quinn right now, um, how did this project, so the second part of the project, you had it with students, right? And how did it become this international project where you have uh, other artists from, from Japan and Korea? So after in own space two, we feels like he want to do it one more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he he need he wants to create some challenge uh, mm -hmm. from in own space one. Like if want to uh, what challenge can it be? Yep. Yeah. So the idea of working across countries come with in on space uh, three. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Mm. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so he uh he contact uh the artists you know all around the world and then uh, mm -hmm. contact the Japan Foundation to uh to fund this project. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So he changed a little bit of rules, like yeah. because the version is two minutes, but this yes. version get two and a half minutes. Okay, and right. And from working uh, one day into two yeah. days. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I see. Okay, a little bit more time for them. Okay. Um, Thank you for the slides. I think that's our last slide that we're going to look at. All right. So now all our faces are expanded. And now I'm going to take a look at some of the comments that have come in. Yeah. So we've got something by Max Yam who says that I'm afraid that many people are watching digital theater and I'm not, he says. Okay. And someone asked that William then asked him, Max Yam, why not? Why, why aren't you watching? And Max, so it's an interesting dialogue we have here. So Max says, I think I've slowly realized that theater is an escape for me and with only a laptop and a phone. If theater exists in my laptop and phone, I have nowhere to escape to. Okay. So interesting, interesting uh, uh, observation here Yeah, from a, a theater goer. Okay. Uh, there's something by Yagnya as well, which I shall just pull up here. Wow, <laughs> a whole block. Let me read that. My personal issue is my attention span. With live theater, I have to be there, and there's silence. The environment makes me focused. With Zoom or online stuff, it's harder to sit through. There's movement around my home as well, so like there's no pause button to the life around me. And pausing a live show isn't an option, and pausing a recording drops the momentum. So I don't hate online theater but it gives me some level of anxiety lah. Okay. So, mm, let's see whether we got other uh, comments. 
So Max has replied to what Yang Yang said just now. He said, uh, yeah, I FOMO. FOMO means uh, fear of missing out <laughs> because he's asked, you know, people are asking Max, right? What, why aren't you catching digital theater? It seems like, you know, there is a growing audience for that. So he says, uh, he FOMO that many people are watching and making digital theater, but he says he's not gotten used to it. Okay. Um, Okay, before we go and address some of those uh, concerns by audiences, why don't we ask each of you about your own experience with working in this medium? Yeah. Um, how has it been? Why did you decide in the first place to do digital? Okay, I, I think some has been kind of answered a little bit because Gwyn talks about like the pandemic and how artists were disconnected, right, from each other in audience. But what about you, Joe? Um, I think it was to try, it's because I wanted to use the medium, actually, mm. uh, mm -hmm. because I knew that I knew that theatres uh, were not going to open in a way that would make it affordable for theatre makers to, to use it. Um, right. With the SOPs, you can only have a 30% capacity and mm -hmm. you know as a as a independent theater company we need 100% capacity in order to to right. pay our bills yeah. <laughs> in the theater mm -hmm. so um i began to think well how do we still connect to our audiences so for me right. it really was about the audience not about uh, um or rather not just about the art so, mm -hmm. because, so, so I began to, I mean, you know, of course, the, the pandemic gave us an opportunity to think very deeply, ask a lot of mm -hmm. questions about what mm -hmm. do we, what, what do we do and why do we do it? So I began to think a lot about, well, what is this thing called theatre? And what, mm -hmm. what is the act of making theatre? And the mm -hmm. act of making theatre to me was always about trying to connect to the society that I, that I live in. Or, and that society could be local, that society can be global. There's a big diaspora of Malaysians as well. But right. also, there's also a global society of people who want to hear stories mm. uh, and to connect to connect through stories. Mm. So I, I kind of decided that Para would be a good play to do. One because right. I felt that some some of the things that it was dealing with were were things that I felt um, were very current. Mm -hmm. uh, but two because I felt that if I'm going to start experimenting with doing live theatre. You know, mm -hmm. So it's not it's not filmed beforehand. It's 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 performed live to a to an audience. It yeah. needed to be a play that I was very familiar with, right, right, <laughs> and right. a play that the actors were very familiar with, because mm -hmm. I wanted the actors to really inhabit their bodies, right, mm -hmm. so that the, the the energy of the actor's body was very present even mm -hmm. through the screen. I, mm -hmm. I think the problem that we can have face in making theater of dance or performance for the screen is that mm. we become very presentational. We, we are only performing very flatly. Right. So I, I, and so I thought, okay, if I'm going to try to understand this technology, I need to also have actors who have a kinetic memory in their body of mm. that, of, of that performance being 360 degrees. Right. Right. Wow, okay. So they're, they're mm -hmm. very aware of their back. They're very aware of their environment. They have mm -hmm. memories of of looking mm -hmm. at somebody over there. Right. So for me, that was that was kind of important because I knew that otherwise it, we would have this sort of flat dimension. Right. Um, right. So 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 for me, this is kind of stage one mm -hmm. of this of this mm -hmm. beginning of, of this experiment to work digitally. Um, right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because okay. I have been working on with other people on on things which we haven't put, we have we haven't taken to the public, and what yeah. I've discovered there is is this flatness. You mm. see? So I'm trying to figure mm. out how do we get rid of that flatness in mm. in trying to do digital theatre. How do we right. not feel that we need to present, yeah, right. directly? Wow. Mm. Okay, thank you so much, Joe. I think what's very interesting is that you're talking about a play that originally was written for the stage. And then yeah. you're thinking of how to adapt it to like, let's say an online or Zoom format, right? And I think yeah. this is a nice segue to YY actually, where I think her exploration is what kind of work could exist in that format could be like, so is the ontology of like the Zoom play itself that you're exploring rather than yeah. wanting to like adapt something which is has been done on stage 
uh, to that format, right? Why why you want want to share with us about that? Hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Alfian, and, and thanks, Joe. Yeah, I think um, contrary to Joe, my entry point was definitely different. Um, for me, I was interested in doing something as far away from like live theatre as possible because I was starting to see um, digital theatre as a new art form in itself, like not an extension of live theatre, not a replacement, but something that almost straddles the line between like theatre and film, new thing altogether. And so I didn't want to be beholden to... Um, the conventions of live theater. Um, so if you ask me to adapt a play that was written pre-pandemic and stage it now, I'll be like, oh my God, I don't know how to do that at all. Because we constructed a piece that was completely separate from that. And then, so I think my team was very much also on the same page in terms of that. Um, uh, creating something totally new. And we were looking at the potentials of digital theater and what it affords us that like live theater doesn't have, for example, because people always see like digital theater as a poor cousin of live theater. Oh, we don't have the audience. We can't hear the laughter. We cannot feel the energy and all of that. But in a way it's like delayed gratification because we get to hear all these responses during the talk back. And, and it, it is okay that, um, because we can still feel energy even if we're performing live without actual audience um, responses. And so in terms of potential of digital theater, I was most excited by the fact that it allows us to collaborate internationally without like massive touring expenses. And the fact that we still spend like three to four hours um, per rehearsal, like four times a week on the space together, we developed a very a closeness and a kind of um, relationship with each other, even though we never met live, and we still shared a lot of like cross cultural exchanges. So, like all the uh, positives of international collaboration still came through in this medium without all the um, baggage of like money and finding money. And so that is some and 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 for the audience to be able to tune in from different parts of the world at the same time, like that was something that was quite special to me and my team. Um, and yeah, just really going with the um, dual benefits of digital theater, which is that it has the lightness of mm -hmm. like theater on the stage, as well as the intimacy of film. And then how can we both of those mm -hmm. and then create something new and something special from that? Okay, great. Thank you so much, YY. Um, if I can pick up on one of the things that you raised, which is this international collaboration, and the idea that the barrier for entry for that is so much lower now, right? So much cheaper because we don't have to fly in people. Uh, we, you know, so the and and we can even like rehearse remotely with one another, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that those are the kinds of benefits or pros that you mentioned. So I want to mm -hmm. throw this to Quinn as well. For in own space part three, how do you think doing things digitally during this pandemic has allowed you to make connections with? artists from outside of Thailand. อ่าถ้าถ้าเกิดว่าถ้าเกิดว่าเป็นในเรื่องของการรับส่งสารก็ไม่ได้ไม่ได้มีความแตกต่างจากในสเปซ 1 และ 2 มาก. So in terms of uh, catching the message and create uh, their own mm. things in on space 3 not really uh, different from the second and the first one. Mm -hmm. But the work in the result that happens along the, along the, the project. There was a piece that we think uh, if, if he is not born there, raised there in that area, in that space, it's impossible to have these kind of ideas, impossible to, to create things right. like this. Right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. So interesting. So that, that kind of like uh, connection with very, very different cultures. Um, and then somehow like linked, right? So what, what I really liked about, for example, in Own Space Part 3, uh, so if I can just share, there are, there's a sequence of, let's say, three uh, little films or, or recordings or pieces. So in one of them, a Korean uh, dancer is showing her father choreography 
teaching him how to dance. And then the next piece is Quinn's own piece, which is like a tribute to his own dad, right? Mm -hmm. And it's based on some photographs of his father and he's created some movements choreography from those shots. And then the next piece, so you can see sort of like the ball being passed from one to another. The next piece apparently is to this traditional Japanese dancer who, whose own father has passed away, if I'm not wrong, right? And then he's doing this certain movements from traditional Japanese dance and yeah. Uh, and, and I think what's so interesting is that the ball that's been passed, <laughs> I mean, that ball is actually passing through customs and immigration <laughs> of different countries, right? <laughs> Yeah, and it's and it's being passed or it's being thrown over wider distances. So, I think um, okay. So let me just pull up um, something here by Chloe Lee, yeah, who says that. Thank you for sharing. She says I too am afraid of digital theater, but on the brighter side, what do you think are the advantages of digital theater that are specific to the medium? Okay, and and I think one of the things that we've definitely raised is this idea that oh, all these international connections seem to be more possible, or at least we are thinking in those directions where we might not have had before, because we always think of like, oh, yeah, I got must, must have flight, must have accommodation, you know? Immediately we think of all the costs that accumulate when we, are, when we want to bring in foreign artists. So do you want to add to some of that about like what you think are some of the pros, some of the benefits, advantages of, of doing these things digitally? I think if I can jump in, I think yeah. you know the, the advantages are very simple and very clear, mm -hmm. I, I feel. But mm -hmm. I think for me, the more interesting question is not those obvious advantages. Yes, we can work with people uh, across time and space. You know, we can yeah. work with people not, not in our own place. Um, but just going back to that um, that mm. uh, that piece by by Quinn. Actually, I was struck by the same thing. I was struck also by this the the the, the recurring uh, motif of the father or the parent, and I, I found it very moving, right? Because it was so human and transcending of of uh, culture. Um, but I particularly kind of was very taken by the piece called My Father, the one that I think started the ball rolling, uh, where the the Korean dancer is teaching her father how to dance. But actually it starts off with her, her just rehearsing with I think three other friends, very kind of uh, contemporary yet traditional Korean dance in a studio. And it's juxtaposed with images of her father doing very ordinary things, eating in his house, um, watching TV, reading a book. And that ordinariness of, of what he was doing with a kind of strangeness in a way of her life as a dancer, <laughs> doing strange dance with hats, you know, very artificial in a way, I found really beautiful because it was this, um, it kind of made me think, yes, why do we do this? Why do we do this thing called art? Why do we do this thing called performance, this thing called theater? So it, the presence of her father who is audience, but actually not audience, but just a person living with the artist was to me really interesting. It made me think about, again, uh, this pandemic. And, you know, sometimes as artists, we we kind of are very separate from our families. I think the pandemic has allowed us to be with people in a way that maybe previously we couldn't. So I really appreciated that she kind of brought this into her, her piece. And then when she ends up dancing with her father, you know, mm. I felt this is a way to make new, <laughs> digital theater it's because it felt very right. felt very truthful felt very honest felt in the moment i'm trying to deal with my world what is what is my world mm. um, she's mm. trying to ask mm. questions of herself and her art uh, mm. so I, I think that for me it's you know going back to well what is theater what are the impulses that make us that drive us to make a piece of theater and um if here we are lonely, we are alone, we are isolated, then we tr we try to make pieces out of that that isolation. And I kind of felt that's what she did in that piece that I, I found very fascinating, which then right. got passed on to other people who then also explored some similar ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So talking about that, that kind of connection, Jo, I'm just going to pull out something by Rebecca Sangita Dorai here. She says, what I like most about this medium is that even with an online performance, there is still a li living, breathing human being on the other side of the screen. And while I can't see them, I can definitely feel the energies coming to me through the wires. This gives yeah. me peace. It gives me respite in a possibly lonely time as both a performer 
and as an audience member. Okay, and she continues here. She says, we cannot conflict live performances with an online one. While we grieve the loss of live theatre, we shouldn't deny the emergence of digital theatre. This new path is a delicious one and its growth should be encouraged and explored. Okay, so that's a positive note there. Um, the idea that, you know, still, I'm not just just data packets, right? I'm an actual body here <laughs> on the other side of the screen. Um, and at the moment, I'm going live. So there is a kind of co-presence as well, actually. I mean, we are inhabiting the same time. Uh, it's 9.40 in Singapore, 9.40 in Malaysia, <laughs> 9.40 a.m. in New York, and 8.40 p.m. in Bangkok. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, you know, um, we are real. <laughs> okay, I want to pull off, um, pull out one question from Sheila here, who says, "What's the most exciting discovery you've made in the process of creating digital theatre during this period? And based on that experience, what advice would you give teachers and students of theatre at this moment, especially as schools and colleges navigate new modes of teaching in the midst of the pandemic?" Yeah. So, mm -hmm. what's what's exciting? What have you discovered about this? Mm. Anyone? Why? Why you want to give this a shot? Mm -hmm. um, I think tying back to the previous question also of um, what's special about uh, the digital medium um, and mm. uh, benefits to it. I think one thing that hasn't quite been raised yet is that it increases accessibility as well for people who find it harder to get out of their homes, like right. people with disabilities or older folks. It's not as convenient for them to move around. So the fact that we can now serve these people as well um, is something that's quite special to me. And um, main mm. discovery, something I've learned, um, it's quite a technical one, but um, I was interested, uh, as in I was fascinated to see that like in live theatre, right, it's so much mm -hmm. easier to like take in everything at once. The fact that there are people mm. around me, there's music, there's a group of people doing weird abstract movement over there, someone speaking text here, sound, I can take it in as a whole. But mm. on the digital space, it feels like um, the less is more principle really applied here because I've seen some works that are like, there's a lot going on, different things, and then couldn't focus on the content. It became like very mm. distracting in a way. So like for my team and I, it was about constantly finding the balance as to what is what makes something like visually, orally interesting, but still allows me to focus on the content. So not load it up with all the technical like gimmick mm. in a way, um, but find something that is still cohesive um, mm. and helps you focus on the story. And then to the second question about, well, and uh, a new mode Advice. of teaching or learning. Um, I'm not exactly an educator, so I cannot super speak to that. But I think mm. embracing the medium. And for me, it was like new work creation, like just moving away from what we know of theater in the past and well, taking some sensibilities from there, taking some stuff from film and like mm -hmm. cinematographic stuff, like camera angles um, and yeah. like taking elements and then melding it into something new and embracing the medium, medium there. And what mm -hmm. my team and I did too, was that um, before going straight into creation of the work, we had yeah. a few rehearsals that were more like exploratory based. So there was one, like a two hour session where my sound designer and I just let like a movement and sound exploration. So things like um, 10 minutes to play with space, how far back can you go? How near mm. can you come um, left and right? Then after that, take your laptop, move it to different parts of the room. That's why there was a scene in Who's There where the camera was like in my closet. Um, mm. And it was... Hey, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, yes yeah, it thank was you. Super exciting to see the different angles. And then embracing yep. the te yep. technological media, which is the fact that like people might drop out, there might mm. be lags. You mm. cannot sync things perfectly. It's hard to yeah. speak like um, in synchronicity. Um, and then make something from those apparent flaws too. Right. Yeah. Okay, wow. So so it didn't make you anxious at all that things might not synchronize or there might be lag or all those things. I think because we realized it was inevitable, there was no way the movements could sync. And for right. me, that was a very important part of um, my life creation. But I was like, 
it took me a while, but then eventually it's like, you know, instead of everyone having to hit this on like mm. a count of four, let's just do like a slow version. <laughs> like, so, so something as simple as that, you know, just embracing it like that. It's not right. going to up. And then we also prepped um, like what happens if there is a technical difficulty, like if an actor falls out, having a backup plan for that, that is also creative mm. and interesting and exciting. So mm. yeah, there was some level of anxiety, but can be creative around it too. Right. That's exciting. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. I jo? think I'd, I'd say some similar things to to YY. Mm. Yeah. Of course, I think one of the one of the things was that we could reach the play to people who would ordinarily not be able to go to the theater, and mm -hmm. we made our tickets really cheap. I mean, our cheapest ticket was five ringgit, and mm. we did that kind of deliberately so that. Um, people who don't usually even go to the theatre would get a chance to watch it. So we have mm. people who've never seen theatre before experience mm. it for the first time using uh, using Zoom. And so, and so for me, that was that was great. I mean, that it could reach to... I mean, I have friends in Sabah who always say, how come you never come to Sabah? And now, like, okay, we're going to Sabah. <laughs> we're yeah. going to Penang. We're going to... I, actually, we were, I think we reached, like, 20 countries. Uh, mm. in, in, that, 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 was, that was really good. Um, mm. But I think it's also this... You know, what's challenging is all the things that YY also talks about, the challenge of um, of, of the technology. And of course, it's, it's always good. I mean, as an artist, we always like these challenges, right? We want to find new ways of doing things. And mm -hmm. um, when we when we first started doing it on Zoom, we, we thought, okay, this is this looks quite good. And then we decided, no, no, we don't. it's not good enough. So we, we added microphones. Then after right. a while, oh, well, the sound could, is now better, but we don't like the we don't like the picture, so we, uh, mm. we added webcams, and uh, then we we we're trying to figure out how to add music to it, and mm. we tried to use music just through our ordinary computers. It, it didn't work very well, so then we ended up using a gaming laptop which has two screens, and right. so then at the end we had three three laptops going on in the office. The first laptop was used by the producer and stage manager to bring the actors in. The second mm. laptop was used by me to to switch what the audience sees. The third yeah. laptop. Which had two screens was used by the streamer to to put it out there. She could also colorize it. She could in, make the color better because, mm -hmm. of course, depending on where you were, the connectivity was different. We had one yeah. of the actors in, in in Indonesia, and connectivity in Indonesia was much slower, so his color was a bit more grainy. So she could mm -hmm. kind of connect it so that they all looked a bit more like they were in the same space. So right. things like that with big learning curves and right. are very interesting and yeah. how she could also add music to it. So these were, of course, all, all the things that you learn to play with, you know, I think mm -hmm. trying to answer this question, mm -hmm. there are all these possibilities, I think, with mm -hmm. Zoom and yep. to try to um, uh, make it a three-dimensional. I guess I'm still very fascinated by it. I'm still very obsessed with it being three-dimensional. Right. <laughs> you know, okay. I, I think as a theatre maker, I, I like things to be yeah. in three dimensions. Mm. So I, I, I like the fact that YY is uh, exploring the three dimensional space of her apartment. <laughs> just just as we're talking about 3D because she's been moving her laptop yeah, yeah. around. You know, you know, I do wonder why people don't move around more like on Zoom. Like every time I see people they're sitting there, I'm like, I have to like <laughs> go to the kitchen sometimes i use the bathroom if i'm with people i'm comfortable with and i'm like this is something that we should play yeah. more with yeah actually like, at, 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 at one point yeah. in our rehearsals we, we 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 had the actors moving the laptops a lot then after a while right. i thought we we're all getting a bit too seasick so yeah. that's not because we didn't have very good cameras but then when we once we added the um, webcams we yeah. moved it less but we still wanted to have that thing as you said just to create some dynamism sometimes right where right. um with 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 an emotional movement as well, or right. physical movement that you want that to happen as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that links back to the idea of the, the three dimensional as well. Yeah. Um, I want to ask our friends from Bangkok. Actually, uh, we've been talking a little bit about audiences, right? And uh, have you? discovered yourself let's say maybe reaching new audiences audiences who have never seen either theater or your works before and have you got any feedback from them yeah me me like one who may not have seen the performance that's also many people who never experienced theater before 
that uh, has a chance to look at the project too. Mm-hmm. 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 I think that um, digital theater is actually one of the medium that mm-hmm. you can actually reach out to some other audience out right. of what right. we already right. have in mind. Uh, just a mm-hmm. follow up question there, Queen. Mm-hmm. So, so far, the in own space, it's recorded, right? Uh, and then, but uh, yes. are you working on a new Zoom performance or something like that for the end of the month? Oh yes, yes. Ah, record Oh, but that that project oh, is okay, also okay, uh, recorded. Right. I see. But six, some, 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 try for this recording is more like how to make it in one take, mm-hmm. like the theater. There's no editing. Mm-hmm. Is how how we work on that. Wow. Okay. So there will be some editing, but it's just like shifting the camera, but everything will be just happening. In, uh, wow, this. okay. That's so interesting. I mean, that's one way to kind of like capture the real time sensation yeah. of, of being in the theater, right? Um, yeah. uh, how long is a piece going to be? Ah, 22 minutes. 20 minutes, okay, all right. Not <laughs> that's still quite a long take. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and this will be at the end of the month. Uh, what date? I guess we can look for it uh, on your Facebook or something for uh, more details about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 29 August. Okay. August. Yes, August. Yeah, and you can find okay. it on the book. The name of the project is it's, uh, around us. Around us. Yeah. D&D. Around us, yes. D M theater. Okay, so that's D E E and then dash N G. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna pull out a couple of other comments here. Yeah. Um, Cheryl says this. I think what's exciting for me is the combination of technology with theater elements, and exploring things that we would otherwise not explore with life. Theater. I don't see it as a replacement, but as an emerging subset of it, and that's really amazing. Okay. Um, Max Yam says one of the possible advantages of digital theater is that audience can chat alongside the performance. So <laughs> he's saying this is a parallel space or a performance that takes place. And then he asks, is this an advantage? What do you think? You know, so I know some people, for example, they digital theater for them becomes this kind of communal activity where they have watch parties. So they don't want to watch it alone. They ask some of their friends, and as they're watching, they'll be like commenting and messaging one another and all that. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Do you open up these kinds of like chat boxes when you are doing uh, your shows, screenings of of your works? Yeah, I mean, we we yep. did that in Para, and it was really fascinating. <laughs> I think yeah. uh, so that, that from the moment people came into the theater, they were talking to each other, and because I think people wanted to mm. replicate that feeling that we are going to the theater. And actually, yeah. my, my, my decision to start doing Zoom theater was because I started watching theater online with a friend of mine. She was right. in another town, I live in KL, and but we would decide to go watch the theater at the same time. And we'd always be, we'd be WhatsApping each other beforehand. Oh, where are you? I can't see you, you know? So we'd play this game of going to the theater and then we would be watching the show and then we would we would, we would message each other sometimes. Oh, I really like this actor. Or oh, this is quite boring. But we always never would let up. We would never leave because we felt it would be rude to leave the show. Mm. So once when we really didn't like a show, we left during intermission. <laughs> but otherwise, we always mm. stayed <laughs> mm. for the whole show. Um, and I think it's that that feeling that because people I think um, want some things which are familiar. And I think that idea of it being live is is that thing that's familiar. Mm. And I, I posted on my Facebook page. Uh, before the show uh, started, or the day before the show, I said, you know, make your popcorn and join us. And a friend wrote to me on my Facebook page and she said, Joe, you can't eat popcorn in the theater. And I said, yes, you, now you can. 
isn't it great? <laughs> now you can. I said, think of it as being like Wayang Kulit, right? Sh sh shadow puppetry shows where you go and you can eat, you can drink, you can walk away, you can come back. So it has, for me, it's like, again, questions. So ask you questions as an audience. What is it to watch theatre? What is the act of watching theatre? Um, how free are you? Uh, now when you're watching, why do we, in fact, why does theatre have all these rules about how to behave? Mm -hmm. Those rules are not very old. Actually, these rules are, are maybe about 150 years old. And mm -hmm. uh, if you look at like, mm -hmm. I remember reading this book about Japanese theatre and when Western theatre first came to Japan, the Japanese found it really weird that they were not allowed to shout out about when they liked an actor or they weren't allowed right. to like comment uh, loudly. Mm -hmm. They were told, no, this is very wrong. This is not the right, this is incorrect behaviour. Mm -hmm. So right. I think it's be a kind of a good chance to sort of like reinstate incorrect behavior in the theater and question mm. why we have certain rules and whether those rules are really necessary. That's or so interesting. Yeah. Uh, that connects with this comment here by Cheryl and she says, oh my god, yes, I've realized when watching things online, I'm texting my friends <laughs> who are watching at the same time and many of my friends do the same too and I feel like this should be embraced. And then Wei Liang uh, comes in and he says, Cheryl Tan, it's a kind of frenetic solidarity that we cannot freely express when we are in the actual theatre space because of conventional decorum or house rules, right? So I think this is a, an interesting development also because we keep talking about the form. Uh, we, think, we talk about it mostly from the artist's point of view and the infrastructure and all that. But I think it's also maybe like reshaping spectatorship mm -hmm. as well. How do we watch theatre? Yeah. The kinds of socialities as well that that might emerge from this um i mean i'll, that, I'll just des describe one thing that happened during the show yeah. <laughs> when our sound suddenly went off and yeah. we were not aware of it on our side yeah. and um and then suddenly in the text boxes people were saying the sound's gone off the sound's yes. gone off and people were then right. messaging me on my phone on instagram on facebook everywhere mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i of course was not paying any attention because i was trying to control what was being <laughs> going on, on the screen but i okay. really appreciated how, how invested people were right that were, yes that they were like yes. fix this right now and then of course yeah. we were trying we, we had to try rush to try to fix it um, right. but it made me feel how live we were you know, okay. and so the I, audience were shouting at us, you know, fix your sound. <laughs> and I'm going to yeah, ask this though, which is that, um, so I said maybe this is a kind of different mode of spectatorship where you can actually chat with your friends, or, but is this kind of like an online distracted mode of consuming data and information though, which is that, okay, I'm watching a show, but at the same time, I, I want to go and check my Instagram at the same time and, and you know, chat with my friend. And then do all these other kinds of like multitasking things, which is part of this mm. whole like late capitalist <laughs> kind of behavior that you just need to do so many things at the same time. And and you know, in a traditional theater, as has been mentioned by Yagna, for example, you are a captive audience. You're not allowed to do anything else. You're not allowed to be distracted, not allowed to look at your phone. So I'm just wondering, on one hand, we are seeing, you know, there's the freedom to not be so disciplined when you're watching watching a show but at the same time is the freedom necessarily a good thing in the sense that you're actually quite distracted you're not giving your hundred <laughs> percent to the to the work as you would have yeah what do you think yeah, yeah. when i um going back to max and yangya's comments from like earlier in this uh panel too um mm. i think when people talk about attention spans in relation to like digital theater, right? Like yeah. my mind goes to thinking about when watching a film or like binge watching Netflix and I can mm. go for hours and hours just zoned mm. on like this TV show. And I'm like, if right. that is possible, it's not about the screen. Yeah. It's about, okay. well, I, I guess we need to, I don't want to say step up and do better because that sounds like super harsh, but this medium, this digital yeah. theater medium is super new. We've, uh, most of us have only been doing it for a few months. And so, it takes mm. something like that it takes years and years to produce something that is um that can really keep people's attention span in and that is like um mm. really substantial and like as awesome as those like tv shows that we binge watch so i think we can get there with time and patience mm. and mm -hmm. well, funding of course yeah. so um yeah in, in terms of distraction that is where my mind goes to that mm it is possible to keep people's attention there. And yeah. I also do the same thing of like texting my friends and watching a show, um, a theater mm -hmm. show. And um, that's- You do? 
I do. <laughs> absolutely do. And it, it's still my work. <laughs> yeah, it's not distraction to me. Yeah. It's still, in a way, engaging with the work. Um, and thinking about the community, how to build an online community and how to create a um feeling of like a live theater space. I've been thinking about why I'm so drawn to Zoom um, compared mm -hmm. to other streaming platforms like StreamYard, for example. And yep. I feel like Zoom is special in a way that there is a meeting yeah. link. We all yep. go into this meeting and we are all in this shared like Zoom space, for example. Whereas when for StreamYard, it streams to like YouTube and Facebook and I can see the comments here, but I don't really know who are in this space. So yep. Zoom creates this like kind of sense of like a, a room where we all gather together, quite cozy feeling to okay. me actually. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, yes. I appreciated that when we, we use Zoom as, as our platform, but we, we, we uh, then streamed it on uh, in a theater space called Cloud Theater. And I really appreciated that they tried to make it like a theater experience, the experience um, right. mm. so that you could, you know, you go in, you wait in the lobby, then you go inside the theater and you, you can see your friends, you can wave, you can chat, you can talk mm. to them. Uh, people mm. were discussing traffic, things yeah. like this. But I also really like that people could have the live, live chat on the side because especially I think, I mean, maybe younger audiences are very good at multitasking and, but without it being a distraction. And I don't know if this is a modern thing, actually. Um, for mm. me, traditional theater has always been a place where you don't have um, uh, you, you you don't have so many rules. So if you go to watch okay. Wayang Kulit, and I love yeah. the, the experience of going to watch Wayang Kulit or Menorah or something in a in a in a village, because mm. you you can focus completely on what's going on, and you can tune out for a minute, but you know exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel mm -hmm. in a way you're you're very alive to the whole experience. You, again, yeah. it's three hundred sixty degrees. Mm of experience you're you're aware of your fellow audience member you're not in yep. a cinema right yep. where you're where you're disconnected from your fellow audience mm. member I, and i like mm. i like this I, I like this aspect of it uh, later when i when i read the the chat <laughs> it was yeah. quite fascinating what people how people were responding discussing, you know, they were yeah. discussing mm. or just re reacting with yeah. sounds sometimes you know I, I, if I could jump in for that, I, I just wonder though that when we look at some traditional art forms, I mean, some of their stretch like so long and over yeah. over many nights. So it seems like the form itself allows you to kind of like move in and out. Whereas right. like in Western drama, which is like mostly psychological realism yeah. and everything mm -hmm. is concentrated within like 90 minutes on average. Yeah, mm -hmm. that doesn't give you that kind of like space actually to you know to to be that kind of an audience member i don't know mm. yeah so maybe it's also to look at works creating works that might replicate the traditional art form that that allows this kind of not 100 percent attention sort of like straying in and out kind of thing mm. uh rather than to to just put your psychological realist play in this new format yeah okay i want to pull out a few more uh uh questions and and observations Becca the bus says maybe part of the fear of digital theater is insisting that this is some version of theater as opposed to say being more related to a twitch stream or a mukbang <laughs> so yeah so i think i mean it's interesting to explore i mean what what makes this theater right we we are always going to be exploring these categories and definitions and debating it yeah what is mukbang um, is um why why as a young millennial would you like to i also don't know <laughs> i i was thinking i kind of know but but uh Kuin, do you want to tell us why is mukbang <laughs> <laughs> And what is Twitch? I, what is Twitch stream? We are all we're so old. The first time I heard of that, Twitch, I heard of that, Twitch, but not Mukbang. Okay, so, so Mukbang yeah. are these like eating videos, right? That that from like Korea. Where, it's like show. Yeah, you eat you're and watching you watching people uh, eat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh what do people eat? <laughs> Oh. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, it's a genre of its own. But you know, feel free to go and uh, correct this this semi boomer here. There okay. was uh, I just read a news article about how there is this. I think I'm not sure. Is it a Thai guy who was staring into space for two hours? And Indonesian. 
Indonesian. Oh, yeah. Indonesian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thousands, or <laughs> and I'm like, if someone can stand to space for two hours, then we can do digital theater. You know, <laughs> I think this is one of those things where you can watch for a while and then stop watching and then watch yeah. again, right? And you can move yeah. in and out of that. Yeah. Okay, Wei Liang had a comment to what you said just now, Yan Ying, which is um, when you talked about the glitches and all that. And he says the reflexivity of embracing the inevitable kings of the digital theater format rather than trying to eliminate them wholesale. He says it's so, so important. Yeah, I got a few other comments. Um, Isaac says, I'd argue that the lack of physical connection leaves this new form as a medium that is not quite theater, definitely not film, but something else, right? So I think we've been working through questions of like hybridity in this form. Okay, uh, Yatnya has a question here, she says, Question though for people who can't make work from home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she says, in my case, I have to share room. There's no privacy or silence to make any real work. And I want to, but it's been a struggle. Any suggestions at all, I'd really appreciate it. Okay. Um, and then Becca comes in and he says, actually, or drag queens who can't be in drag in their family home. So actually, this whole idea of like creating Zoom theater, as much as we think it's democratized certain mm. things, but at the same time, certain structures in real life also are reproduced, right? In this, I mean, we can't escape the fact that some people don't have their private spaces, etc. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, so let yeah. So yeah, you know, says yes. Like when people can't have home as a safe space to create. Okay. Uh, let's see. So Niza says, enjoy the discussion, <laughs> discussion guys. <laughs> okay. I want to say that Yang Yang and uh, Becca's uh, comments yeah. gave a, definitely a new perspective to me that I haven't thought of um, in terms of digital media mm. and creation before. So thank you to you both. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, Rebecca has, has actually, um, um, basically she says, uh, to, to Yatnya and Becca to go to her house. Okay, it's, it's very long, so I will just move on to another one, <laughs> to some other comments. Um, Sheila has a comment here which says, besides the urgent necessity of governments and major organizations to step up and fund theater and arts during the pandemic, what additional kinds of support would you value from governments and other large organizations at this moment? So actually, this is a question that I've been meaning to ask, which is, how did you fund your zoom projects your your online works where did the funding come from hmm. can i ask uh queen yeah for all the different in own space yeah <laughs> now he's thinking about the the question of supporting and, and the only answer right now is just money for now <laughs> mm, okay right <laughs> Because like he uh, he using the, the the those money to explore to experiment um, in this platform, mm -hmm. so we need that that kind of support, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a question? So, Sorry, because I think I, I maybe lost the question. Yeah. So basically, I think like in own space, for example, I think maybe the cost is not so high because you're asking your friends mm -hmm. to participate, right? But, um. How did you manage to get like uh, Japan Foundation, for example, to come in? Oh, and did in. they provide some funding for for in own space three? So there was a clear object objective when when uh, when he uh, gave the proposal to Japan Foundation to ask for yeah. the funding. Right. Okay. Mm. Okay. So that's great. I think what's what's interesting is that um, often in our own home countries, sometimes we don't have a national arts council. I mean, Singapore has, but I know many places in Southeast Asia they don't. So. Uh, often you have to rely on all these cultural organizations like Goethe Institute, Alliance Francaise, uh, Japan Foundation. And I think what's interesting is that now in a moment when it's easier to do collaborations, it opens up the possibilities of trying to, I suppose, get some kind of funding from outside the country. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Ishan has got a little comment here where he says, in Bangkok, you're still allowed to take photos of the show with your phone. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he's he's talking about the, the different modes of spectatorship, right? So just well, now I was in, in scolding. Thailand, yeah. Kind of like independent theater, we are very small and we need as many people to uh, help us with the PR. So mostly in our show, we kind of like allow to take still photo, not video, but right, without yes. flash. And after that, you can post because sometimes we don't we don't even have um, our own photographer to yeah. shoot <laughs> on the stage. Okay. So yeah, right, the more right. people take the photos, the better. Yes. Right. But and I think it's that, uh, please. Can can I answer Sheila's question about mm-hmm. uh, funding? How how um, uh, governments and organizations right can come in? Yeah. Uh, or, or rather, like with. For myself, uh, mm. the decision to do Zoom Para was because I thought here would be a medium that would be very affordable. Uh, right. So, um, because of course, if you usually, if we're doing something in a theater, in the past when I thought about, well, how can we film a production and put it online? It becomes very expensive. I mean, we don't have the resources in Malaysia mm-hmm. to hire um, and you know expensive camera equipment and people. So yeah. actually, this production was very, very, very. Um, what's the word? Uh, um, small, <laughs> okay, small. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it, and it, in fact, I think we didn't realize how much, how how big a project it was until we were already halfway through it. And then we thought, right. oh, wow, we really wish we had more people, but just didn't have the funds. So mm-hmm. in the end, it was essentially myself, the producer, the person doing the streaming, the composer, and that's it. And then they, so right. the actors had to do a lot of the work as well. So they had to be there, you know, get things them, themselves, be very be very resourceful. Um, and you know we had to do all, all our own marketing, our own promotion, our own, everything really. Um, but it's because we 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 didn't have the money, but right. so we knew that we'd have to try to rely on ticket sales. At the yep. same time, we had this mad idea that tickets should cost really little, mm. and that if you could pay more, you'd pay more. Right. So right, you could pay right. anything between five ringgit and hundred ringgit. So mm. rather than applying to a grant from a government source, which you know would take a very long time, basically you were telling audiences, look, if you can afford it, pay 100 ringgit, and then right. somebody else will pay five ringgit. So mm-hmm. that's one way, I think, um, to kind of mm. put it back to your your community in that right. way. Yeah, I would right. Right. Yep. jump in here as well and say that the pay what you can model is something that I'm very interested in for digital theater as well, mm-hmm. because um, we don't want like artists who are already struggling financially during this time to pay like a $20 ticket. But then at the same yeah. time, we have friends who work like stable full-time jobs who want to give yeah. more and that allows yes. them the opportunity as well. And um, mm-hmm. to speak to the question of how we funded who's there, it mm. was really on a shoestring budget, but just to be mm. transparent um, too, um, it started with a US dollar, $750 stipend from New Ohio Theater wow. for the festival. And so Alvin and I were like, oh, oh my God, uh, we had like 12 collaborators. How do we pay them? So we mm. started out by like forking out our own money and being like, okay, we're going to pay these people like, um, not a lot each, honestly. Um, well, we had a town hall where we showed um, our budget. So I'll just say like it was like 200 each. And then New Ohio Theater said that there would be a, like a box office split. They would take like the first 1,500 and then they mm. will, um, the rest will be like a 50-50 split. So 750 stipend and then about $2,000 of box office split. And then we mm-hmm. also, the Transit Ensemble also set up like a donation kind of system for audience to feel compelled to after the show give to us we made about almost a thousand dollars from that so wow. it was really really bare bones and we made it clear to our collaborators that like this first iteration of the work is like a passion yeah. project and we were very 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 moved by how much people how much time and energy people were still willing to give and um mm. and that was because we had a two-month period to put the show together if we had like nine months we'll be yep. more like gung-ho about like finding funding sources Mm -hmm. the most Mm -hmm. important thing to me at least is to pay people fairly to pay them the number of hours they work so that is the next priority in terms of this project now Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. creative stuff we had fun the creative stuff now it's really finding a sustainable um funding model and i think i'm gonna tie ishan's comment about taking pictures of the show with your phone um to funding which is that one thing i realized was um i was very excited to see all the Instagram stories of the show mm-hmm. that came 
um, during that four day period. And yeah. um, the fact that people were in their homes could just like snap a picture, a short video of it, really mm -hmm. helped word of mouth tr to travel. Right. And eventually we sold a total of 823 um, tickets of varying wow. price cost. Whereas in the actual theater space, I think a show like that in New Ohio space and max only like 300 plus tickets. Right, right. The fact okay. that word of mouth can really travel with this medium. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Uh, it also shows us that there's also opportunity for education and engagement. And that's why Who's There had like a yep. town hall a week after the show where we talked honestly about um, what it means mm. to create in this medium, um, funding uh, ideas and alternatives and like came together to do a group brainstorm. We even showed our budget because we there is nothing yeah. to leave that nothing we have yeah. right now. And so mm. people were surprised by the amount of work that it takes into putting um, in this um, medium and how mm. little we were getting paid just because there's just not enough money going around right now. And we calculated mm. the hours and how much yep. we're getting paid. And each of us got paid like less than $2 per hour. Um, I calculated all my hours. It was like six <laughs> per hour. And people yeah. were like, oh my God. And that compelled them to give, give more as well. So mm. there's an opportunity for education here because people just don't know. Um, Non-theater people just don't know how much it takes to put together yeah. a show like right. that. It's not just right. like play, you know. Okay. So thank you so much for that, YY. Um, I think we should wrap up soon, but I just want to just pull off uh, some people's comments just to <laughs> acknowledge them. Okay. So just now we're talking about mukbang, right? Okay. But uh, now we are all schooled. It means eating live stream. That's mukbang. It's very satisfying to watch people eat. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then Twitch, if you guys must know, is watching people play video games. Okay. And Becca says it's also very satisfying to watch a drag queen who fell asleep. So apparently, there are many things you can catch uh, online. Maybe one last hey, one. Please. Yes, go in. So you want to share a little bit about the phone space one and, and the three? Yeah. So actually, like uh, in this kind of pandemic, yep. uh, one one thing is very very strong is working under conditions, mm -hmm. new conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in our space, so in our space one, no one get paid. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, what, what, what we have from the comments that if what, what will happen if we don't have a private space to make uh, performance or to create is that right. it can be counted as a condition to work on that mm -hmm. because we also have many conditions. Yeah, 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 in it was best time to say that we can do it, but we can do it. Like even in own space three, every artist has the same budget, but everyone right. works in their own condition and makes different things. But mm. yeah, our bank account the more he spent the money to rent the small machine. <laughs> I <laughs> see. Some spend money to a higher musician. I see. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. In terms of creation, yes. yeah. 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 okay, interesting. Okay, um, actually, there's one last question which I think is really interesting, and let me just pull it out. And maybe that that would be like our last question for today. I mean, it's great that we're getting such an engaged audience that's uh, not only schooling us but also asking really interesting questions. Um, this is good. Uh, Pei Fang asks, "Has this new medium of theater altered your relationship with the government or the authorities? Are there any?" restrictions that you anticipate in the future and i know yy has, has has touched on this quite briefly before where we are looking at this is a new frontier this space online so far is not a regulated space yet mm. right so like in singapore when we want to put up a play we always need some kind of performance license but so far we've been able to do a lot of these shows etc without license <laughs> um what do you think do you, do you see this as maybe potentially democratizing the space for theater making um you told yeah. me don't talk about it 
Now we're talking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the part of me is like, hey, don't say lah. We yeah, we got yeah. this space. Just do lah. We don't yeah. yeah. Don't alert them. Don't mm. alert them to this. Um, yeah. yeah. But okay, if I might just contribute something to this, I feel that um, there's interesting ways in which online content is being regulated. And sometimes I feel that they're quite enlightened ways. So I'm really a fan of Netflix's system where you key in a password, mm-hmm. right? To be able to watch, let's say, the R21 shows. And why, why am I a fan of this? Because let's say if you're like a very liberal parent and then you think your kids can watch, let's say, LGBT stuff, then you make that decision. The mm-hmm. government doesn't make that decision for you. Yeah, so actually... I do feel okay. I don't mind regulation, you know. I don't mind like shielding minors from graphic violence or pornography, right? But but I think there needs to be a way in which, you know, this kind of I I feel more like enlightened digital infrastructure for regulation. Um, yeah. Yeah. MBA should look into stuff like that, lah. Yeah. I feel like I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. I feel like it's gonna come. I hope it doesn't. But then I'm thinking about like how do they regulate? Like for who said, for example, the fact that it was presented as part of a New York theater company's like um, uh, festival, like it would not be cool for IMDA to like step in on that. Right. So I'm like, right. if the regulation does come, if the censorship does come. Does this mean then we need to do like offshore ticketing? Does this mean that we need to be presented as part of like other fest, um, other countries like festivals and stuff? Mm. How far is our reach in that way? Yeah, you know, because to yeah. me, digital theater really feels like international waters. Like no, mm. um, mm. so yeah, it'll be exciting to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think definitely things that a lot of uh, sensors are not anticipating. I mean, as much as we are not anticipating some of these things, but also from the point of view of the regulators and the authorities, they themselves are not anticipating how these new horizons have actually opened up, right? And allowed for for a lot more freedom uh, and and allowed for, yeah, I mean, they found themselves not so able to control the space as before, yeah. Well, okay. Yes. Just, just 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 before just before Para opened, uh, mm. maybe just three or four days before it opened, there was suddenly a um, the Malaysian Ministry of um, Multimedia and Communication, mm. who are in charge of all these things, it suddenly came up with an odd ruling that everything had to get a license, even some even a TikTok video, oh. even uh, uh. even a um, online um, performance, right. and of course the netizens just sort of jumped on this decision and called it political and questioned it very 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 harshly mm. so of course people were saying to me oh so what's what does this mean for para will you still go ahead and uh, i remember we just said yeah we're still going to go ahead even if they say there's going to be these you have to get a license for it because we thought well until mm. they make up their mind until they right. make something very clear uh, how are you going to regulate these things right. you know what what constitutes a performance what constitutes um, and, and how do you go about licensing something? So we we sort of largely ignored it, and then it sort of died down. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> as, yes, as yes. Often, often so do in Malaysia. Say, the Malaysia government made a blunder with their proposed mm. license for online content that was retracted immediately after it was announced by the minister. Okay, you know right. what? I've been I I'm really enjoying this conversation. I think we can go on for a very long time. <laughs> But I should wrap up soon. Um, and so I will just throw one final question, really, really final uh, to each of you, which is after this pandemic, assuming that there is an after, do you think we will still be making digital theatre? So even after theatres have been allowed to open, even after audiences can start filling theatres, do you think you will still make digital theatre? Yeah. Let's hear from each of you. So now we come out. He he uh he will do it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Kung may alay tiyak kam na platform ni you. There are something he want to explore in this platform. Lumang ka sa ngan kong 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 tuig do yung 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 the 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 work yung 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 Great, yeah. So you do see some value in the form that you want to explore further, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joe and YY? 
Yeah, I would agree. I, for me, it's uh, I'm just beginning the exploration. So if even if things change globally, um, mm. but yeah, I think that this is the beginning of the, the beginning of pandemics. <laughs> Mm. So that our, our our future, I think, will hold pandemics, mm. and that there'll be times when we'll have to go into lockdown. I, you know, I'm a child of the '70s, you know, so I just remember all those science science fiction films I watched back then, and they all seem to be about people who lived in this sort of digital world. You know, mm -hmm. 1984, that the film which I, I watched when I was a kid, or The Fly, or um, yeah. what's, what's you know, there's always this world where people are, people are living on a screen. They wake yeah. up in the morning like Winston Smith in 1984 and they, they do mm. the exercises on the screen. And, mm. yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, why, why? Yeah, and for me, absolutely yes as well because digital theatre, like I said, for me, it's a totally different art form and it has potentials and benefits that live theatre doesn't and for that very mm. fact alone. Um, well, the fact that it really opens up international collaborations without um, yeah. having to expend yeah. like, a lot of money and resources, the fact that it's intimate and I can take you mm -hmm. to my kitchen or my bathroom. Um, yeah. There's things like that that are very exciting to me. I want to go mm -hmm. through that too. Great. So some audience members have uh, agreed with you. Kalto Mahmoud says, I hope so for all the reasons you, you all have said. She hopes that, you know, you continue uh, doing digital theater. Yaknya says, please do like watching international stuff is fantastic. <laughs> and Yaknya says, despite the kinks, despite the hurdles, I'd rather iron stuff out than to answer the challenge of digital theater with the delete button. So she definitely sees that this is a new emerging form that it's worth investing in for the future. Okay. Well, I have to say, I so not to say I don't miss the other stuff. I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I, I, mm. I miss being able to see people on a on on a, on a stage. You know, and form those pictures and mm. yeah, I miss it. Mm, 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 mm. It's gonna come back, uh, you know. That I, I, I fully believe it. <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna come yeah. back. So that's why I can mm -hmm. embrace the digital theater because I know that live theater is gonna come back, and I know that I will go back to it when it comes right. back. Yeah. Right. Okay. Ah, oh, great. So wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, and of course, I mean, one of the wonderful things about the digital, as I've mentioned early on, is that we are all able to come together. So just to remind our viewers that Quinn and Chuan are now in Bangkok. I mean, they all look like we're all in the same space and at the same time, but they are in Bangkok, one hour behind. Joe Kukatas is coming uh, to us from Malaysia, from Kuala Lumpur. And YY, despite being Singaporean, is actually in New York. And it's morning there, 10.30 a.m. there. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in. Thank you so, so much. And uh, we hope we've given you uh, enough to think about uh, when it comes to theater, digital theater. And uh, I know people say post-pandemic, but I'm just going to say the future. <laughs> okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye.